Okay, I think it's time to get started. I need both. Um, I will be speaking about porting FreeBSD to the Firecracker uh, virtual machine. So I recognize a lot of you, but for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been a FreeBSD committer since 2004. Uh, I've been the maintainer of the FreeBSD EC2 platform since 2010, uh, since I got it running. Uh, Amazon decided that I was doing interesting things and, and gave me this label of Amazon Web Services Hero in 2019. Um, doesn't really mean very much. I get free admission to their co annual conference in Vegas. They give me a couple thousand dollars of AWS credits uh, and I get some briefings, although those ones I was getting because I was working on an operating system on East U anyway. Um, just for the record, I do not work for Amazon. They do not pay me. I would love them to give me some money, but they do not give me any money. Um, I do not speak for Amazon, despite having this label of AWS Hero. Uh, and I have signed lots of NDAs with them about a variety of things. So if you ask me a question, I might say I can't talk about that. Probably not for this talk because I don't think I've signed any NDAs related to Firecracker stuff, but just in case it comes up, uh, more likely if you ask me a question, I say I can't talk about it. It's just because I don't know, but uh, I'll, I'll let you know uh, when the time comes. So Firecracker, what is Firecracker? It is a virtual machine monitor that uses uh, Linux KVM. So it's it doesn't do, do, do any of the kernel side of stuff. Uh, that's just Linux KVM. Uh, but it does the user land. So it's like QEMU or the, the user land part of Beehive. Uh, Amazon developed this for their Lambda uh, serverless compute service. Of course, as we all know, serverless is servers, uh, but Firecracker is uh, sort of the, the magic that makes that work, uh, or one of the many pieces of magic, I suppose. Um, so Lambda lets you just give some uh, source code for one function to Amazon and say, when somebody makes a request to this URL, call this function. And they take care of all of the other gunk in between of having an operating system kernel and having a file system and pushing packets back and forth and scaling up to thousands of VMs as needed to, to service the, the traffic that you're getting. Firecracker is very much focused on minimalism and security. Of course, Amazon has millions of customers, uh, at, at, at very least hundreds of thousands using Lambda. Um, they have, they don't, they can't audit the code people are running. You just send them the code and they, and they run it for you. So they need to make sure that one customer can't do anything nasty to other customers or the, the Amazon infrastructure. Uh, it's Apache 2.0 licensed. Uh, some some files in there are free clause BSD, um, so it, it's very permissive. Uh, and it is written in Rust, which is uh, very popular within Amazon these days. Um, some other people also like Rust. I hear um, some people think that Rust helps with security. I'm not as convinced as some people, but uh, it certainly has some merits. So why do I want to port FreeBSD to Firecracker? Well, every time you port to another platform, it, it helps to show up some bugs that you've, you, you've uh, had lurking for a while. Uh, I know this is one of the reasons that NetBSD likes to port to everything. Uh, booting in a minimalist environment can, can help to reveal any performance issues you have. Uh, if you have less devices, uh, th 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 they'll... If you have too many devices, you, you can end up having everything hidden by what your hardware is doing. Very minimal environment. You, you really have what's what's left is the, the important core stuff that you can work on. It would be nice if Amazon would support FreeBSD in Lambda at some point. Uh, I have no indication that they plan on doing this, uh, but I know that there is interest from Linux people in being able to bring their own Linux kernel uh, because mostly... Um, uh, the um, IOUing code um, in the Linux kernel keeps on having new versions, and then people want to use the latest version with their particular applications. So, if Amazon decides to let people bring their own Linux kernels, and maybe we can uh, bring in a, a FreeBSD kernel um, within Amazon Web Services, FreeBSD is usually referred to as other Linux. So, maybe it won't be too difficult. To <laughs> uh, and finally, because it's there. Uh, 
I had a, a little bit of time on my hands. Firecracker was cool. I like doing stuff in FreeBSD. Eh, how hard could it be, right? So you've got a kernel, you want to run it. First place you, you need to start is how do you actually start running it? Um, Firecracker can, can load the kernel into memory, and then it needs to start executing code somewhere. Well, Firecracker is designed to boot Linux. Um, FreeBSD is not Linux, despite what some people at Amazon may think. Um, fortunately, there were patches available uh, to support PVH boot mode in addition to the Linux boot mode. Uh, and FreeBSD already has support for booting PVH mode uh, with Zen. Um, this, is, this is where PVH boot mode originated from uh, as a, a form of booting Zen. It is now a more general boot mode, but uh, we had the Zen support there for PVH. Uh, so the first problem I ran into is Firecracker couldn't find the PVH entry point. Uh, and it turned out that uh, PVH boot mode is specified as you need to have an ELF note that says, if you're booting in PVH, this is where you start executing code. Uh, we had an SHT note, and Firecracker was looking for a PT note. Uh, for those of you who know more than I do about ELF, maybe this makes sense to you. Uh, my, my, my understanding is that the difference between these has something to do with whether it's actually loaded into memory along with a binary or not whether it's just a, an indication to the loader. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, we had the wrong sort of note there. This got fixed pretty quickly. Uh, once I mentioned it on IRC, uh, a couple of people, I think Ed was one of them, uh, came back to me with a, a patch uh, the next day, just changing the FreeBSD linker script so that we had recorded the right sort of note uh, for Firecracker to find. <laughs> okay, so now I, I've got Firecracker is loading the FreeBSD kernel and starts executing code, and it crashes. Uh, okay, so what do I do now? Well, I don't have a serial console yet. Um, no serial console means no kernel panics, no printfs. So what, what do I have? Well, when I'm running, I can see, is a Firecracker process still running? Uh, if the kernel dies, then Firecracker exits. And I can also see, is it using 100% of CPU time, or is it using 0% of CPU time? So each time I launch a FreeBSD kernel, I, I get a single Twitter feedback. Either the CPU hit a triple fault, and Firecracker exited, or the CPU hit a halt instruction, and the Firecracker process is running, but using 0% of CPU time, or the CPU is still running, and it's using 100% of CPU time. So this let me do a binary search through the kernel. I would sprinkle halt instructions into the kernel and see, did we reach the halt instruction before the kernel died? <laughs> this, this actually works remarkably well. Uh, you, you need to dig through a lot of source code to do it, but uh, it, it narrows down very fairly quickly uh, what is making things break. Uh, after doing this for a few weeks, I realized out B to the serial port actually works. <laughs> uh, so if I'd realized that a little bit sooner, I could have gotten more useful information out. Um, but uh, a binary search with, with halt instructions actually still worked pretty well. Uh, so one of the first places that FreeBSD was dying is uh, it was trying to make Zen hypercalls. FreeBSD PVH code was for Zen, so it was expecting to be running under Zen. It was expecting to make Zen hypercalls and have a useful response. Well, uh, Firecracker is not Zen. It doesn't do the hypercall, of course. So my first workaround was just find all the hypercall, uh, all the Zen hypercalls, just comment them out. Um, that got rid of those crashes. Um, what I have in the tree now, um, any place that we were going to make a Zen hypercall, uh, we check, are we actually running under Zen? Uh, if not, then don't do it. Um, there are places where uh, there's, um, you know, obviously, if, if the Zen hypercall is doing something important, then that wouldn't work. Um, but there's places where we just have debug um, hypercalls saying, you know, print this to the, the Zen debug log. Um, so under Firecracker, we don't get that debugging inf information, but that's fine. Next problem I ran into is the memory layout. Um, PVH booting, uh, there's a start info page which gives you a bunch of system metadata, like your, where is your kernel? Um, Zen puts this when it's loading uh, in PVH mode, it, it loads the kernel first, puts the, the start info page above that. 
And FreeBSD needed some free memory for uh, generating a kernel environment, stuff like that, uh, very early in boot process, and was using the page just after the start info page as the place to use or for scratch space. Uh, it turned out that that was a page at Firecracker assigned as the kernel stack. <laughs> <laughs> Using your kernel stack as scratch space doesn't work very well. <laughs> so the, the fix was uh, instead of just looking at the start info page and using page after that, look at all the different addresses. Uh, so the, the kernel, any modules, the start info page, of course, uh, and then set fizz free, which is the, the beginning of sort of scratch space for us uh, to be the page after everything instead of just after the start info page. Now, before we can set up virtual memory, we need to know about what physical memory we have. Uh, if you're booting on actual hardware, the bootloader gets a memory map from BIOS or, or EFI and passes that as a preloaded module to the kernel, more or less the same way that kernel modules get, get loaded, um, that get passed in from the loader. Uh, PVH booting, the kernel, well, we don't have a loader. The kernel's loaded directly, so you're not going to get the information that way. Uh, with under Zen, we can make a Zen hypercall saying, please give me a memory map. But of course, that doesn't work on a Firecracker. Well, it turns out uh, Firecracker uh, uses version one of PVH. Uh, Zen, Zen's version is, has been retroactively de declared to be version zero of PVH booting. Um, and the start info page now actually has a, a pointer to the memory map. So. If the start info page uh, version is one or more, we now just parse the memory map that we get from the Zen hyper from uh, the the start info page uh, instead of making the Zen hypercall. In fact, we even do this if we're running under Zen because why not? Why make the hypercall if we've already got the information there? Uh, now, Firecracker doesn't use HPI. <laughs> um, you know, HPI is big and complicated, and messy. Why do it if you can avoid it? So. Great, but FreeBSD uses ACPI to tell us where's the hardware, including where's the CPUs and where's the local APIC. Well, it turns out um, FreeBSD gets a little bit unhappy if it can't find the interrupt controller. Firecracker doesn't provide this, but it does provide the same information via the historical Intel multiprocessor specification MP table. This is this is the the system that Intel specified back in the. 90s, I guess it was, um, when when they first made uh, systems available with, with two Pentium processors. So we have support for that in FreeBSD via device MP table. It's not in generic, but OK, I, I have a custom Firecracker kernel configuration, so I, I slap device MP table onto there. Uh, well, it turns out that Linux looks for the MP table in the wrong place in memory, not the place that Intel says it should look. It looks in a at 639 kilobytes, or 638 kilobytes instead of 639 kilobytes. Yeah, Linux cool. also doesn't parse the table correctly. <laughs> Firecracker was designed to boot Linux. So Firecracker does what Linux expects. Well, we now have a, an options <laughs> MP table Linux bug compat <laughs> FreeBSD, uh, which implements bug for bug compatibility with Linux uh, in how we, we find and parse the MP table. <laughs> At some point, I want to get this fixed in Firecracker, but I'll deal with that later. OK, now we've got serial console working. We're actually starting to boot into user land. Um, everything looks good for the kernel. Uh, we get into user land, and we get 16 characters, and then it stops. Well, I've actually seen this bug before. Uh, back in the very early days of getting FreeBSD working in EC2, uh, I tripped over a bug in QEMU, which EC2 was using at the time. Uh, their, their UART emulation uh, lost an interrupt. Uh, if you fill the UART transmit uh, FIFO, uh, then it's supposed to send you an interrupt once it empties, saying, hey, you can, send us, you, you can write some more characters now. There, there's now space in the FIFO. It wasn't doing that. Uh, so. I put a working out into FreeBSD uh, a long time ago, um, hardware.brokenTX FIFO equals one, which says, instead of waiting for this interrupt that may, want, may not actually arrive, just wait the amount of time that it should take for the buffer to drain, for the FIFO to drain, and then go on and, and write more characters to it. So Firecracker does not share any code with QEMU, but somehow they managed to write the same bug <laughs> about 15 years later. Again, something I want to 
fix, but haven't gotten around to. I also found that Firecracker, uh, that FreeBSD couldn't read any input by Firecracker. Uh, and when I, when I traced Firecracker, I found that, in fact, Firecracker wasn't reading any input from its terminal. Now, when we probe the UART, we actually fill the input buffer, the input FIFO of the UART, uh, in order to measure its size. And then we drain the FIFO. Uh, we drain it using the UART FIFO control register, which you, has a bit that you write to saying, please flush this register. Uh, but please flush the FIFO. Firecracker doesn't implement the FIFO control register. So we were writing to that, that bit, and it was just ignoring it, and it was leaving a full FIFO. At which point, Firecracker very reasonably said, well, there's no space in this FIFO, so we won't read any characters from the, from the console that Firecracker is attached to, uh, to, to write into the, the guest OS. So work around now uh, when we try to flush the, the FIFO. Um, if we flush it and then it says there's still data in the FIFO, we just read and throw away the bytes until it actually is empty. Again, something I want to fix in Firecracker, but haven't gotten around to. OK, so now we can boot FreeBSD with a memory disk that's compiled into the kernel, and we can interact with it on a serial console. This is, could actually be useful for some things. Um, some uh, you know, very, very high security environments, you, you may only want to have putting in input via the serial console and, and getting answers out via the serial console. But yeah, I want to do a bit more. Um, I didn't have, at this point, any devices, any, any uh, disk devices or network devices working. Uh, Firecracker exposes these via MMIO, that's memory mapped IO, vert IO devices. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did, it was add vert IO, MMIO to the Firecracker kernel config. Um, this is actually part of the generic ARM64 kernel config, but not part of the generic AMD64 kernel config. I, I'm not sure why, but probably because the only people that use vertio MMIO are uh, embedded people generally. Uh, now, FreeBSD expects to find, to discover MMIO devices via FDT. This is a flattened <laughs> device tree, um, which is something that embedded systems use a lot. Uh, this is not how Firecracker does it. Uh, instead, it, it passes parameters via the kernel command line, which is a very Linuxy way of, of passing device information. So this, this directive here tells, tells the, the guest OS, there's a memory mapped device uh, occupying four kilobytes of address space at this, this address, uh, and it uses IRQ4, IRQ5. Um, so I added a, a new, new file to FreeBSD kernel um, for a, a VTMMIO command line, which looks at those directives, parses them, and creates the device nodes. Um, once you create the device node, then the usual probing system in FreeBSD works. So it will then, FreeBSD by itself at that point, identifies uh, this is a uh, vertio block device or this is a vertio network device. So we don't need to worry about anything after that. Uh, problem is uh, FreeBSD parses a command line into environment variables. The way that Linux does things, or the way that Firecracker does things, is if you have multiple of the same sort of device, uh, you you have several things on the command line with the same variable name. Um, Vertio MMIO device equals this, equals that, equals this other thing, uh, which doesn't work very well if you're turning those into environment variables because only one of them is going to be the environment variable. Uh, so I, I modified the the way that we handle early kernel environment, which is say the command line and static values that are compiled into the kernel. So if we get the same variable name multiple times, we just append a, a underscore and then a number for, for the extra values. Um, the first value doesn't have that appended because for backwards compatibility, um, I wanted to keep the existing behavior, uh, but this way, any code that used to work will still work, um, but code that knows to look for multiple values uh, can, can find them. So at this point, FreeBSD was up and running. I could go into it. I could, I could SSH into it. Uh, network's working, disk is working. And it's just fine until I run Fisk. Or in fact, I reboot the, the virtual machine. And because I didn't shut down cleanly, it comes back up and it runs Fisk automatically. Uh, and then I get a kernel panic. Uh, and it turns out Fisk is one of very few things that will cause on page lines disk IOs. Anything you're generally doing through the file system, 
I see Warner cheering at the back. Uh, anything you're normally doing through the file system, uh, it will you'll end up with page aligned disk IOs. Uh, but Fisk is accessing our file system and it's doing it from user land. Uh, and it, I guess, doesn't have page lined uh, memory allocations in, in Fisk. Um, this doesn't work very well with Firecracker because their block backend only supports a single segment of data. Um, QE moves vert IO backend supports 255 or maybe slightly less than that, um, certainly over 250. Uh, most devices out there will support many segments, uh, you know, sort of scatter gather for the data. But vert IO in Firecracker, they wanted the most minimal implementation they could make, so they support one segment of data. Well, if your data is not page aligned, uh, then it's probably not going to be physically contiguous pages in, in physical memory, um, no matter what it is in, in virtual desk space. Uh, Vertio uses physical memory for, for its, its buffers. So we need to bounce that data. So I, I modified Vertio block uh, dri uh, driver in FreeBSD to go through BusDMA, uh. which is a, I can't remember what it stands for, but anyway, it's, it's a, the system that most FreeBSD uh, drivers use for sort of translating pointers to data that we have we use from from the kernel into stuff that devices can access. And it handles stuff like bouncing data if it's not aligned properly. Uh, well, this is my first time with BusDMA, so I didn't get everything right. Uh, I, I broke dumping with Vertio block because. Uh, I, I was carefully preparing the request structures that were used for regular uh, IOs um, with the bits needed for BusDMA, uh, but dumping was creating new request structures uh, which didn't have things set up for BusDMA. Uh, I broke dumping a second time because I assumed that uh, null would just mean don't do anything. And, and on x86 it does, uh, but on other architectures it Apparently, freeing a map of null caused problems. Um, I also broke vertio on PowerPC because I assumed that bus, ad bus addresses and physical addresses were the same thing. Uh, it looks like, in fact, they are the same thing on everything except for PowerPC. Uh, but on PowerPC, they are not the same thing. Uh, there's special code I now have in there now, which says, if we're on PowerPC, then tell bus to DMA, do not translate into bus addresses. But I think it's all working now. If something breaks with vertio block, it's probably my fault. <coughs> so current status of things. Um, on AMD64, the Firecracker kernel, kernel config will boot in a patch version of the Firecracker VMM. Uh, I say a patch version because I have not got the PVH support patches into mainline Firecracker. I was hoping to do that sometime between January and March of this year. Something called 13.2 release happened, and I didn't have time to do this. Uh, the serial console, the network to disk devices, they work. Uh, Vertio VSOC is not implemented yet. Uh, this is some. This is a, a Vertio device that Firecracker provides. Um, FreeBSD has never had any use for it, but uh, maybe at some point I'll get around to putting that in. Uh, we don't support ARM64. Um, this may be difficult. I'm not sure, uh, but uh there's no such thing as pvh booting for arm64 as far as i'm aware so we may need to do linux booting for arm64 i i understand that somebody's been working on linux booting for freebsd so maybe maybe you will will pvh boot in on amd64 and, and linux boot on arm64 freebsd boots very fast minimal environments very little to do when you're booting up so now I'll go into the second half of, of the talk, uh, talking about uh, making a FreeBSD boot fast in Firecracker. So it's a great environment for, for talking, looking at performance overhead. Uh, no physical hardware, minimal devices. It gets rid of a lot of noise that you're looking at uh, in the boot process. So you can launch a FreeBSD VM. You can see the boot process scroll past you in the console. You can tell it to reboot. Um, in Firecracker, reboot means shut down the VM. I don't know why they made that choice, but in general, the, these are throwaway VMs, so you don't really reboot them. Um, I, I, you reboot by doing a triple fault, so I guess it, it works. Um, you can watch the shutdown process scroll past in the console. And if you notice it stops scrolling, it means there's something you need to look at in there. Uh, once you've gone through the 
the really obvious stuff, then uh, you, you can pull out the um, profiling tools like a TS lock is one I wrote um, and deal with the, the smaller stuff. So first thing I noticed, shutdown was surprisingly slow. Um, <laughs> FreeBSD prints a message when you're shutting down the system saying shutting down. And there's a comment in the FreeBSD source, wait one second for printf to complete and be read. <laughs> in case you didn't realize you're turning off the computer, you've got one second to read that message. Okay. Most people already know that they're turning off the computer or rebooting it. So there's now a, a <clears throat> current reboot wait time sys control. Uh, it's defaulting to zero. Now, if you want to have your system wait and let you read that message, you can change it back to one <laughs> or 10 or 100 if you want to wait even longer. The x86 CPU reset function uh, had a one second delay in it. This is because we were waiting for the auxiliary processors to shut down, except that now we actually wait for them to tell us that they've stopped before we wait an extra second for them to stop. So the fix there was just delete two lines of code. We, we no longer have a, a one second delay in there. Uh, I was booting FreeBSD on a VM with 128 megs of RAM. I found it was surprisingly unusable. Um, I could do a little bit, but fairly soon I would start having processes die with uh, uh, because the system was running out of memory. Um, turned out that 32 megs of that 128 megs was being reserved by Bastia made for bounce pages. Uh, having a quarter of your memory allocated to, to bounce pages is probably not very useful. Um, it turns out in uh, BustDMA tag create, we were reserving enough pages for an entire max size request. But I was telling BustDMA tag create, I could only have uh, IOs with one segment. Now, your bounce pages are not going to be physically contiguous. So if you can only have one segment, you're actually only going to have one bounce page. You don't need to have enough bounce pages for a two megabyte IO. So the fix there, I, I told BustDMA, uh, if we have a, a low number, maximum number of segments, um, only allocate that many uh, bounce pages rather than allocating enough for a max size request. And that got rid of uh, 31 and a half megabytes of that 32 megabyte utilization. If you may have seen that message, random dev wait until seeded on block wait. Um, FreeBSD on actual hardware gets a lot of entropy from the actual hardware. In a VM, you don't have actual hardware giving you any entropy. Uh, FreeBSD also gets entropy from the UFI bootloader if you're running through that. Uh, but running out of Firecracker, we don't have a bootloader. Uh, X86, we make use of the RD RAND instruction as a, another source of entropy. But unfortunately, every time we were asking RD RAND for entropy, uh, we were only asking for a little bit of entropy. and not enough to make Fortuna happy and, and decided that it was fully seeded. So the fix here, um, if Fortuna is telling us that it's not seeded, if it's, if it's about to print that message saying waiting for en more entropy, um, instead of asking for a little bit of, of entropy from RD Rand, um, ask it for enough entropy to seed Fortuna completely. Um, same applies to other pullable entropy sources, but RD Rand is, is for our purposes, the, the important one. Uh, and this shaves 2.3 seconds off the boot process because this was running every 100 milliseconds and it took 24 times to get enough uh, entropy at the, the slow seeding rate um, to uh, make Fortuna happy. So now, now that runs very quickly. Uh, we have enough entropy, we, we continue booting. First time this FreeBSD system boots, it records a host ID. Um, when possible, we use the, the value from SMBIOS. Um, this value is recorded by the bootloader and passing as an environment variable. Well, we don't have a bootloader. Um, if that value isn't valid, uh, we generate an atom UID, we print a message, and we wait two seconds to make sure that somebody can read it. Well, you know, under Firecracker, this, this isn't happening. So we were just waiting two seconds for no reason. Um, so now the what I, what I do in uh, RCD host ID if there's an invalid host ID from, from BIOS, then yeah, we'll put that message, we'll wait two seconds. But if there just isn't one, we'll just go ahead and generate one randomly and, and not wait. 
IPv6 mandates that systems need to wait for duplicate address detection. This means you bring up your network interface, you know what address you want to use, and you wait to see, is anybody else using this address? Uh, and we were doing it in uh, RCD NetIF, if any interfaces have IPv6 enabled. So we, we bring up all the interfaces, and then if we've got anything running IPv6, then we wait the mandatory time, uh, see if anything happens. Uh, well, it turns out we always have IPv6 enabled on the loopback interface. Um, so now I I, may, I change it so we we only wait for duplicate address detection if we have IPv6 enabled or something other than the loopback interface. If you have somebody else using the same address as you on the loopback interface, <laughs> you have bigger problems. Uh, so this shaves a couple seconds off of the boot process now. Uh, you, you lose that time if, if you want to use IPv6 with Firecracker because then you're waiting for duplicate address detection. Um, I, I I need to talk to Bjorn about uh, changing the way we handle this and maybe turning off DAD, but uh, for now, at least, without IPv6 enabled uh, on anything except for loopback, um, it, it makes it faster. Uh, now we're moving into the, the smaller stuff. Um, local APIC init code. Uh, we calibrate how long it takes to read this particular register. Uh, this is used in the the code that we use that we run when waiting for RPIs to complete. Um, we're spending about ten milliseconds in this this code, uh, in this calibration loop. Uh, the fix is don't loop so many times. Uh, if you want to measure how long something takes, measuring it a thousand times is pretty much as good as measuring it a hundred thousand times. The your your error is going to fall off as as n to the minus one half. So. You don't need to loop 100,000 times. Um, in fact, this used to be higher. Uh, and I noticed a commit from about five years ago saying, reduce loops. Uh, I sent an email to Kib that, who committed that, uh, saying, can we reduce it further? <laughs> well, yes, we can. And that, that shaves 10 milliseconds off the boot time. Um, this is a standard UART. Um, <coughs> VMs have fictitious baud rates. We may negotiate 9600 baud. That doesn't mean it actually runs at 9600 baud. Uh, in the drain routine, we were calling delay each time we read a character and throw it away. But if you're in a VM, your odds are you read a character, the X runs there immediately. It's not actually coming in over a wire at 9600 baud. So when we're just trying to throw away everything that's in the FIFO, uh, just keep on reading characters as long as the FIFO tells you it's still got data. Uh, if it, if it tells you it doesn't have any more data, then wait to see if another character comes in. But as long as it, it's asserting a signal saying it's got data, just keep on reading them, throw them away. Uh, shaves 27 milliseconds off of the boot time. Uh, this is actually a, something I just had to change in Firecracker. Um, there's a, an x86 CPU ID leaf, which is used by hypervisors to tell guests how fast is a, is a time counter running and how fast is the local APIC timer running. Uh, if you don't have this CPU ID leaf, then you need to run a clock calibration loop. Um, this is something that uh, VMware invented, but QEMU and EC2 also have it. Uh, Firecracker didn't have it for some reason. You'd think if they do it in EC2, they should, it's you know, same company, they should be able to do it in Firecracker. Uh, you know, Amazon's a big company, one team doesn't talk to the other team. So I, I noticed this, uh, they weren't doing this uh, because I put the code into FreeBSD to make use of this leaf. Uh, so I implement that in Firecracker, speeds up the boot process by 20 milliseconds. It also speeds up Linux <laughs> because it, it's a it's a CPU, CPU ID leaf that Linux can use. Uh, Amazon was very happy when I told them about this because Lambda boots a lot of Linux virtual machines. <laughs> Saving a few milliseconds off of each of those boot times adds up to a lot of CPU hours. <laughs> How many AWS credits did they give you for this? <laughs> I, I didn't get anything extra for that, uh, but it, it may have bought me enough brownie points to get the PVH smart patches in there. So it, it's all good. So I know everybody likes flame charts. Uh, this is uh, a chart from my talk last year about speeding up the FreeBSD boot process. So that's what it looked like when uh, FreeBSD 11.1 release was booting. And that's what it looked like last year when FreeBSD 13.1 release was booting. So you can see I, I made a lot of progress um, getting rid of places where things were slow. Uh, well, Firecracker is a little bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we went from uh, 
28 seconds down to nine seconds and then down to 620 milliseconds. And this is the complete boot process from when the CPU is initialized, so timestamp counter equals zero, to when we exit etcrc. Now, of that 620 milliseconds, actually, about 150 milliseconds is SSH key gen generating the SSH host keys. Um, you know, if you're running Firecracker, you, um, you probably actually aren't going to be SSHing into your system, so you can sort of mentally subtract that off. Um, it was pointed out to me on Twitter a couple of days ago that we could probably speed up the FreeBSD boot process everywhere by changing which host keys we, we provide. Most people use electric curve keys now, uh, which are very fast to generate. If we just skip generating the RSA, DSA host keys, uh, that'll help us quite a bit on, on boot time. So uh, that's a little bit difficult to see that that uh, flame graph at the bottom. <laughs> so I, I expanded the kernel portion of this. Um, so this is the FreeBSD kernel boot. So before we start running um, SBIN in it, and that's 33 milliseconds. Um, I noticed uh, four milliseconds were spent in keg alloc slab, three milliseconds in KVA alloc, uh, been under three milliseconds in sysinit VM mem. Uh, I mentioned this uh, to Mark uh, at the Dev Summit yesterday, and he came back to me with a patch. So uh, now we're down to 28 milliseconds. Um, <laughs> Uh, it turns out that we were allocating more p-buffs and made sense on a, a small system. Um, just before this talk, I, I was uh, adding a bit more instrumentation to the FreeBSD kernel. Um, one of the things, that, so the, the, the largest block in there is, is MI startup, which is the, the machine independent startup code, uh, runs through a whole bunch of things called sysinits, uh, which um, various files in the kernel uh, have these sysinits, which uh, Record magic uh, in a, a linker set, which can then get read. It makes it. It means that you don't need to have a main function that calls everything, has everything written into it. Um, and my startup just reads this from from the the linker set, um, but then it needs to sort it to to run everything in the right order. Uh, and it turns out uh, we're using a bubble sort, which was great in 1996 when it was committed. We now have uh, a bit over a thousand. Uh, sysinits being called, <laughs> and uh, about 7% of the boot time now is running that bubble sort. Um, so that I'm going to replace that with a quick sort and shave off another, another uh, two milliseconds from the boot time. So I, there's a lot of stuff I need to do still. Um, I want to add Firecracker kernels to the, the release engineering builds uh, because it, Firecracker runs on Linux. So people who are running Linux and want to try out FreeBSD, they may not be able to build a FreeBSD customized kernel very easily. Um, but if we can provide them with a Firecracker kernel and a, a, a disk image to play with, it'll make it a lot easier for them to try it out. Um, the PVH booting bits and the Zen bits are still kind of mixed up together. So I need to want to finish pulling those apart. Uh, PVH boot bits are actually under sys x86 Zen. So that needs to move to 686x86, one thing. Um, Firecracker config uh, has PCI, ACPI, and Zen bits compiled into it because I couldn't pull them out. It turns out if you try to build a FreeBSD kernel without PCI support, it won't build. Same thing with ACPI. There's only a few places where uh, we sort of accidentally um, call functions from long places. Um, so it should be fairly easy to pull those bits out. Um, slim down the kernel a bit more. Um, right now, the Virtio MIO devices are all hanging off Nexus 0. Uh, we should probably have some sort of Virtio command line bus that these are attached to. Um, Warner tried to, to do this, and uh, it was a bit more complicated than we expected. So we'll get to that at some point. Um, Virtio VSOC, probably useful at some point. Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll look at it. Um, I need to get my, my PVH support patches merged into Firecracker. Um, Sounds like they're, they're going to be happy to do this once I, I get them cleaned up enough. Uh, a couple issues with the Firecracker UART uh, bugs that I want to look at in there. I'd love to convince Amazon to support FreeBSD in, in AWS Lambda. Uh, I know there's some Amazon people watching this talk online, so uh, please make it happen. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to run FreeBSD uh, and be you know launch instances in uh, a few milliseconds uh, to, to run a very short-lived code in FreeBSD. 
Uh, and you know, it would be great if we could port Firecracker to run on FreeBSD. Uh, you know, it's designed to run with Linux KVM. Uh, KVM, Beehive, yeah, it's a good point of virtual machine is a virtual machine, right? So it can't can't be that hard, right? Uh, now, all, all the way through this work, I, I, I talk about things that we did. Um, I, I was finding the problems because I, I was running Firecracker and, and spinning up kernels, but a lot of other developers actually did the work of, of fixing the bugs once I noticed them. So thank you to everybody on this list. Uh, uh, in particular, Warner, I still owe you several dozen beers. <laughs> um, availability, the, the Firecracker kernel configuration is in FreeBSD 14.0 current. Uh, patched version of Firecracker is available in GitHub, uh, in, in my, my personal GitHub. Um, it will be coming to upstream Firecracker soon, hopefully. Um, that's the URL for the, the main Firecracker project. I've got about four minutes for questions. Yes. Are you writing your own Firecracker environment to do all this? Uh, I actually did all this work on uh, an EC2 bare metal instance uh, running Ubuntu something or other. Um, so I mean, yeah, yes, it, it was it was my system, but it was actually one that Amazon owned. It wasn't the hosted Firecracker in AWS, though. Oh no, no, I mean, because I because I had to to make I had to put a bunch of patches into Firecracker while I, while I was. Tra tracking down why things were breaking FreeBSD. Sometimes I added debugging to Firecracker, telling me what Firecracker was doing at the same time. So, yeah, I, I, I had to, to make make changes there. And of course, the, the Amazon's version of Firecracker doesn't have the PVH bits. Uh, yes. Yeah. So you had uh, timings for how fast thing uh, FreeBSD booted. How does this compare to Linux or anything else that boots on Firecracker? Um, so Amazon, uh, the, the Firecracker website uh, says that their their target for Linux is to reach user land within 125 milliseconds. Um, now I, I know they're they're slightly ahead of that. Um, uh, the there's some stats in their GitHub repo, and I think it was 97 milliseconds last time I checked. Uh, but uh, FreeBSD is definitely faster than Linux. Yes. Mark, do you have any idea how difficult it would be to port Firecracker to FreeBSD? Like, you know, have you looked into it already at all? Uh, do, do I have an idea how how difficult it would be to port Firecracker to FreeBSD? Um, Firecracker is written in Rust. I don't really do Rust. Um, my, my my first experience writing any Rust code was working on the hypervisor, which is probably not the best place to start. You know, not, it's not quite hello world, um, and being Rust, it there's code separated into like a million different crates. So even finding the bits that make the K, Linux KVM calls were was difficult. Um, and they're using a crate from somewhere else that actually implements the the KVM interface. So it, it implements the entire KVM interface. I suspect that Firecracker only uses a very small portion of that. Uh, but you know, one of these things I want to do is is go into that code and and add you know printf calling this. Ioctal, uh, so I can see what what Firecracker is actually using from from KVM. So the answer is no. I I don't know how difficult it will be, but you know, you, you, there, there's create a VM, load this stuff in, or access the memory from the VM, start running, set these CPU flags. VMs at a certain point are are not that complicated. So and you know, obviously, you know, those basic functionalities, FreeBSD. Also has to provide them, so hopefully not too difficult. All right, Warner. So I have I have two questions. Um, maybe you covered the first one. I was a couple of minutes late. My apologies if you did. Are you booting the kernel directly, or are you booting it through bootloader? Uh, so the question is uh, booting the kernel directly or through bootloader. This is with PVH boot. So yes, it is loading the kernel directly with okay. from Firecracker. And and you said. Needed to Linux boot the uh, um, AR64. Uh, yeah, so um, Firecracker boots the Linux kernel the way that the Linux kernel expects to be booted from a Linux bootloader. Um, there is patches uh, for adding PVH boot support, uh, which lets us boot the way you know, with PVH mode, um, but. Aside from that, uh, and and that only is on, on the x86 side. So for ARM from Firecracker, uh, 
it will load a kernel the way that the Linux kernel expects to be loaded. I don't know exactly how the Linux kernel expects to be loaded, uh, but it wasn't working for, for FreeBSD. Okay, so it sounds like my work that I'm talking about tomorrow, just before uh, uh, closing, might not be helpful. I've done a Linux boot of FreeBSD on ARCH64, but it's starting at FreeBSD, uh, Linux uh, user land um, and running our bootloader to load it and boot FreeBSD with KXAC. And it sounds like you don't need that. Uh, right, so this is just for the, the recording. Yeah, uh, so Warner is saying that that his work is from uh, launching the FreeBSD bootloader from mm -hmm. Linux user land. And yes, that's that's not relevant in this case. So the, I, I was hoping to help you again. I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> My liver thanks you. Uh, it, it may be that I'll, I'll come, to, come to you with questions about how does Linux boot at some point anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, Feel free. Uh, yes, at the back here. First, thanks for the screwed ups to the startup process. Shutdown. Have you ever done a flame graph of that? Uh, have I done a flame graph of a shutdown process? Uh, no, I have not. And the reason for that is it's easy to record the data of what's happening during the shutdown, uh, but then you shut down and the data's gone. <laughs> uh, now, it, it may be possible to uh, stash it somewhere. Um, the, the kernel message buffer uh, is. If you're rebooting the same kernel, um, we allocate, we end up putting it in the same place in memory, and then you can sort of retrieve it from there. So it may be possible to stash it somewhere that we can retrieve after rebooting, but I haven't looked into that. Um, so get to turn it off the VM. Uh, if if we're if, you say if we just stop, shut down the VM but don't turn it off, and then we can pull it out of the memory from the host. Uh, that that might work. I, I wasn't thinking about that, but yeah, in a VM environment, that that could work. Yeah. Any more questions? You set a breakpoint and then attach GDB to QMU or fire. Oh, fire attack. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but so with GDB, you can you can talk to the, you attach GDB, GDB to the kernel of kernel inside GMU. Right. I don't know if you can do that with Firecracker. That's uh, like, yeah, I, I I suspect that Firecracker doesn't talk to GDB, but uh, you you could probably get Firecracker to just dump the kernel, dump the, the, the VM memory state memory. when you exit instead of um, actually shutting it down. So. It, it probably would be possible to sort of fish it out of there at some point, but it, it wouldn't be accessible the way that um, the profiling currently is, which is uh, you're running FreeBSD and there's a, a kernel syscall which dumps the, the profiling information for you. But yeah, it, it probably could be done with, with a VM. Yes, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, I think we're done then. <laughs>